Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real great honor for me uh, this morning to be here. And uh, thank you all like, for allowing me to share my story with you. So as you have already heard, my name is William Kankwamba. I'm from Malawi. If you are not familiar with where Malawi is, Malawi is in South East Africa, bordered by Mozambique, Zambia, and uh, Tanzania. So geographically, that's where Malawi is. I grew up like in a very like, small village in, in Malawi. I grew up in the family of uh, seven children, all sisters, excepting me. So life wasn't too easy for me growing up. Uh, most of the time, like all my sisters, they would be like uh, trying like, they kind of like had each other, but for me, uh, sometimes like when I go to school, like some other boys, if the, I have the banana, they say like, give us your banana. But anyway, <laughs> I had an elder sister, instead of like telling her that these boys are bothering me, can you tell them to stop? I was so shy, I think I was too stubborn to, to go reach out to her. Um, so as I was like growing up like in Malawi, it's mostly agricultural country. A lot of people depend on growing their own food. We grow corn, we grow soya, uh, soya beans, we grow like sweet potato, iced potato, and also um, sometimes like people grow like uh, tobacco for cash crop. So it's like almost like 80% of the population depends on like farming. So it's like it's real large like um, percentage, like large of like our economy most like it's depending on that, on like um, subsistence like farming. So it's like we don't have like many like big like farms. It's only like small farms that pretty much individual who grew, who try like to plant enough crop that they will use in that particular year like for, for food. And also like if they are lucky, if they harvest enough of it, they can be able to to sell and find money to buy some other needs that they need to, to have for their, like, for their families. So um, agriculture, like in Malawi farming, can be real uh, difficult. There are a number of things that makes like, farming a little difficult to many people in, in rural areas in Malawi. One of the things that makes farming a little difficult is like, the price of seeds, the price of fertilizer, because most of people they depend on applying fertilizer. The land is so, uh, there's lots of like depression from the land, so there's no enough soil, there's not enough nutrients in the soil. So if you want to really like to harvest a lot, you need to apply fertilizer. But the fertilizer is very expensive to many families like to buy if you live like in the rural areas. The other difficult, it's like the weather, that most of the time, most farmers, they don't have control over it. As many farmers, they, we, depend on like, we depend on the land. So we plant during the land season. So not many people have like an irrigation system. So if there's like a problem with the weather, if there's like not enough land, then you're going to be really like in a difficult situation. Or either if there's a, lots of like land, there's like flooding, you can also be like in a difficult situation. So this type of like situation happens a lot in Malawi. So in like 2000 and 2000 to 2001 growing season, one of these challenge, we experienced like some drought in the country. As the results of the drought, a lot of people only harvested quarter amount of the food that they were hoping to harvest. So imagine to live up on that quarter, it was very difficult to many like families. As the results, people started learning out of food a little quickly. And the condition, the situation was so hard because they couldn't really like manage uh, to, to feed their like families. So the famine broke out throughout like the country. A lot of people were starving to death. At that time, my family was also badly affected by the situation. So most of the time, there was like, a, people were like selling some corn at the market, which was coming from the neighboring country, Tanzania. But because of the situation, lots of people who were selling the corn at that time, they took advantage of the situation, so they were tripling the price, which made it a little difficult to uh, people in rural areas who didn't have like, any other job or to find like, money to buy the corn. They had to sell pretty much anything that they had 
before to sell it so that they can buy a little bit of corn to support their families. At that time, my family was also like badly affected by the, the situation. I remember like when, when my mom, my parents noticed that they only had, one, had uh, one bag of uh, corn, they decided like to grind the corn and then started like making cake flowers, um, uh, cakes from a corn flour. So the cakes she was selling at the market, hoping that the profit that she would be getting it will be able to sustain us until the next harvesting season. But it was a little challenging because at that time, the price of, uh, the price of corn keep going up. So the business couldn't really like, keep up with the, um, with, the, with the situation. So the other thing, the other measure that they had to do is like to start like, instead of like, eating two times a day, we start like eating one time a day, only at night, so that a little bit of what we had could sustain us until the next uh, harvesting season. The other like, challenge thing at that time, it was the same time that I was supposed to start a high school. So because of the situation, my parents couldn't afford to pay for my, my secondary school tuition. Like in Malawi, secondary schools, you have to pay for it, while primary schools, they are for free. So because of the situation, my parents couldn't really managed to get money to pay for it. Because all the money that they were finding, they were trying to buy like, more food so that we can still like, we can survive. So I was forced to drop out of school. When I had like, to drop out of school, I looked at my father and looking at those dry field, it was the future I couldn't accept. I didn't want to become like him. I didn't want to become a farmer. It's not that I didn't want to become a farmer because I hate farming. No, I love farming. But I didn't want to become a farmer just because that's the only thing that I can do with my life, which is the case to many people in my community. They are farmers not by choice, but they are farmers because of the circumstances that they are in. A lot of them, they didn't have a formal education that they can be able like, to use to do so many other, other things. So that's why they just like, hope of like, becoming a farmer to plant food that they can sustain them for the entire, uh, for the entire year. If they are lucky, they can be able like, to, to sell some of the crops to buy like, some other needs. So for me, the only way to get out of that cycle was through education. So when I had like, to drop out of school, I was very sad, and I started like, thinking the ways of how I can be able like, to continue up with my education. So one thing that I did, I started like, asking my friends where I going to school that time. So like, every time when they come back from school, I ask them, what did you learn today? Keeping up with like, school work, keeping, getting like, some notes. I was hoping that when the hang would be over, my parents would send me back to school. So I didn't want to be behind from the list uh, of the student. I want to be, by the time I go back to school, I should be in the same uh, page as my friends. So, one other thing that happened, like, like enough, a year before I graduated from my primary school, they introduced the, um, a small library. It had like less than 500 books, most were like textbooks and some HIV and AIDS like novels. So I decided like, to start like, going there to read the books. I was hoping that by doing so, I'll be able like, to keep up with the schoolwork by through um, reading books. So when I was going to the library, I started like, also getting like, this like, interested in like, reading, reading like, science books, trying to understand how different things work. Because when I was much younger, when I was still like, in primary school, a lot of my friends were introduced to movies. So they always like, go watch movies, and they'll come back to school every morning telling me what movie they see, and what was happening. So for me, like in mind, just like thinking about it, like they were able to see image of a person, like seeing a person on it, just like a piece of a grass doing some all kind of action. It was like very hard for me like, to understand. I was like, how exactly does that happen? So when I started like, going to the library, I started like, getting like, a little like, interested like, in science, saying like, trying to understand how different things work. I remember. When I was pretty much younger, um, asking people, how does the car work? 
They say, ah, you just put in a gas and then you start the engine and you drive. I'm like, I know that you need to put in a gas, but how does that gas turn the engine that you can be able to, to spin, be able to drive? Nobody could really tell me. So this book was really like trying like to get understanding. But at that time, the problem was that I couldn't read English that well. So what I started like doing, I was most of the time using diagrams and pictures to learn the words around it and trying to get like understanding. And sometimes I ask the librarian to ask to tell me what does this word means. But the problem was that some of the words they don't we don't have like translation like into my language. So I had like to use my own my imagination and the, using the diagrams and <laughs> pictures, they were able like to explain more of what was like happening. So I was able like to learn how electromagnetics work and how we can be able like to generate like electricity with it. So one day when I went there, I found this book called Using Energy with lots of pictures of the windmill on the cover. So when I opened inside the book, they say windmills could pump water and generate electricity. The word pump water <coughs> attracted my attention. I was like, if I can be able to build this windmill to pump water, then I can be able to start irrigation. I can be able to plant food two to three times a year. Then I can be able like, to triple or double amount of food that we grow each year. So all this hunger problem, I can be able to solve it by having something like that. So I decided to build my own windmill. But at that time, the problem was that I didn't have like, any money to buy like, materials that I needed for my windmill. So what I ended up doing, I ended up going to the junkyard, which was just next to the school that I just dropped from. That school, before it was like a school, it used to be a garage, but a certain company. And when they ran out of business, they donated the place to Minister of Education. And the Minister of Education turned that place into a school. So there were lots of like scrap um, at, the, at, the, at that school, like at the, that junkyard, where I was going to collect pretty much most of the materials that I need. When I was doing all this, a lot of people were a little like laughing at me. They were thinking that maybe I'm going crazy. Some of them, they are saying, maybe I'm smoking weed. <laughs> I remember my mom, she was so worried of me. She was like, you are no longer going to find a wife because no one is going to, no one wants to marry a crazy man. So at that time, although people were saying so many things, I didn't really like stop going to the junkyard to collect pretty much most of the materials that I needed. So at the junkyard, I was able to, try to find like a, a tractor fan, which I used as the Main, main road of my, my windmill. And for the shaft of my windmill, I used the uh, shogo buzoba that I also find at the junkyard. And using the PVC pipes, I was able like, to, I was able like, to put everything like, to, together. So I used like, the PVC pipes for the blades of my, my windmill. So after like, some times of like, working and collecting all this like, piece and putting them together, I was able to Build like the, to build the windmill, which was powering my, my house, and sometimes we're also using the electricity to, uh, to power radio, so we can be able like, to listen what is going on. So when I finished like, doing that, I also had to make like light switch and also circuit breaker, because at that time, all the wiring of my, my, my building was like made out of like the wires, they were just like bare wires. They didn't have like insulator. So I was afraid that if the wire can cross together, they can start fire and it can burn my house. So to prevent that, I had to build my own circuit breaker, which I modeled after the electric bell that I saw the diagram in, the, in one of the book. So when I was like doing this, a lot of people from different areas were able, like, they were able like, to see the windmill. And sometimes they would come up, to my, come up to my village. They would ask me, what is this? I would tell them that this is the windmill. It generates electricity. And some of them, they had like cell phone. They would be like, can, you, can your windmill charge a phone? I'll be here. It can charge a phone. So I'll plug in a phone, and it will be showing that it is charging. I'll be like, yeah, you see that it is charging. Can you take your phone now? They say, like, no, no, no. We won't believe you. We'll believe you if our phone will be fully charged. So they just wanted to get their phone charged. So sometimes <laughs> I just leave them to, to, to get their phone like, charged. 
So the other thing that I didn't stop, I also I continued going to the library. So one day the librarian asked me, why do you always check out the same book? So I explained to her that the book helped me to build the windmill, which was generating power in my village. And she was really like interested to come and see it. She came to my village, she saw the windmill, and she went back. When she went back, um, a few weeks later, the people donated the books in the library. They were visiting all the libraries in the area. So when they got to my library, they, the librarian told them that I was able to build the windmill just by looking the diagrams or the picture in the, in the book. And then they, they, they were also very like, interested to come and see it for themselves. They came, they saw it, and they went back a few days later, a few weeks later, they came again with uh, some journalists. One of the journalists wrote an article, and that article was picked up by one of my friends now, but I didn't know him before. He showed to his boss, and his boss put up that article on his like, blog, and that blog was picked up by somebody who was organizing the TED conference, which was held in Arusha, Tanzania. So I was invited to go to the TED conference. I was very excited uh, to go there, but at the same time also like worried because I have never been out of Malawi. I've never been away from my home, and I've never uh, s s slept in the hotel. I was still wondering where am I going to stay and what am I going to dress up. Um, the other thing was that they told me that I'm going to be flying to the conference, and I have never seen an airplane before. So, but like enough, the people in my village, they told me that, son, make sure that the night before you are fried, make sure that you don't eat. I was like, why? They said that if you eat, you're going to vomit in the plane. So that night I didn't eat. But when we were inside the plane, when we were flying, I was so surprised that they were giving us food. <laughs> I almost like refused that you guys you want to embarrass me. But... Anyway, I think people were just like saying they didn't really know like the experience, how the experience is like to be like in the plane for the first time. So when I was at the conference, I spoke very briefly, and a lot of people came up to me, how can we help you? So I told them that I want to continue up with my studies and also building like more windmill, especially windmill that could pump water for, for irrigation. Because my original idea, when I started like, making the windmill, I was trying to make a windmill which could pump water for, for, the, uh, for my, my garden. But what made me building the windmill, which was generating electricity, was that at that time, I, didn't have, like, I couldn't find the materials that I could use to make a water pump. But I know how I can be able like, to generate electricity. Because when I was like, much younger, I started like, learning how to fix radios. I once thought that when I was about like six to seven years, I, I thought that inside the radio, there are small, tiny people who speaks. <laughs> One day, when my parents went away, I took their radio, I opened it. I was very surprised to see very small things that looks like beans. I was like, are these people? <laughs> Being a kid, there was only one way to tell. I was like, I'm going to pinch one of it real hard. And if it's going to feel like some pain, they'll be like screaming, saying, like, leave us alone, you're hating us. <laughs> but that didn't happen. So as the time goes by, I started like he, taking the radio, opening it up, and then uh, when it's still like functioning, I'll be like removing one component after another, just like to listen what is happening. So when I remove this component, I hear that the quality of the sound will drop. Moving the other one, the quality, maybe the volume will go down, or putting it back, it would go back to normal. Or either sometimes the, the radio couldn't catch any channel. So I would know that this to do with the channel and this to do with the volume. Through that, I was able to learn how to fix radios. But the problem was that most of the time when I'm fixing radios, I didn't have money to buy like batteries because we didn't have electricity at home. So I always like go around collecting batteries that people have thrown them away, collecting them, allow them, putting them together. If I'm fixing a radio that uses two batteries, I'll be at least taking like between six and eight batteries, putting them together. So each juice that remains juice in each cell can add up to be like equivalent to two, uh, to two batteries. So by doing that, I was trying like to, 
I was able like to learn how um, electricity uh, can be generated using like a generator. So that's why when I was building the windmill, instead of like building the windmill to pump water, I end up building a windmill which was generating uh, generating it. <coughs> generating electricity. So when I came back from the conference, I was able to get the material that I needed. So I was able to build this windmill, which was pumping water and also generating electricity at the same time. So the water that this windmill was pumping, we were using to, my mom was using it for her vegetable garden. Some of the vegetables she was selling, some of it we were using it, we were eating at home. So there were a lot of things that started started after like I went to the conference, new new stuff. So also like other people were able like to help me out to, to, to drill deep well boho and we installed this um, we installed like solar water solar solar water pump and it's it pumps water put up in this tank and everybody in the village can come get water um, for free at any time. This has reduced the time that most women and girls spend just going to uh, fish water, they can just go there and get water. It's the only like running water, the nearest place that you can also find the running water, it's like about like 30 miles away. So the other thing that we also like kind of like did, we've started like this organization called Moving Wind Mills. We are also trying to rebuild a primary school that I went to. The school was built almost 60 years ago with a capacity of 100 students. By the time that I was going there, we had 2,000 students. Right now, they have 14, 1,400 students. So the classes, they are not in good shape, and they are also not enough. So far, we have managed to build uh, four classroom blocks. Each block has like four, uh, has two classes. So students, they are able like, to learn in a good learning like environment. So all of the time, I was also able like, to go to this like, school, African Leadership Academy, which I finished in 2010. And then after I finished, I joined Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth College. So when I was at Dartmouth, every summer, I was able like, to go back to Malawi to work on different projects. One of the projects that I did was to install, install solar panels at the high school that kicked me out when my parents couldn't afford to pay for my tuition. So these solar panels, we installed it so that they can have electricity. The idea was that if we can have like, electricity, we can be able to have like computers and projectors. The school doesn't have enough resources. My hope was that if we can be able to go to other schools that have like all the resources that they need, they can be able to do like experiment. We can record those experiments and some classes from other school and the student from this school, they can be able to project uh, that classes and have upper classmate <coughs> student who can be able to act as supervisor, just trying to help out with the student uh, getting whatever um, whatever material that we can get uh, to help out for them, like for their like studies. So we are able like to install this like computers and we also put up created like a local network using this um, device called like eGreener. It's kind of like external hard drive, but that has like so many academic information that student they can be able like to access via Wi-Fi. It's like you are online, but you are not real online behind. It's just like a local network within like a, within like the the area so now the student they are able like to use so another project that i did was also like a, teaching people how to maintain and fix water pumps we have this problem of a water problem pretty much every year during the rain season a lot of people don't have like clean drinking water in many like villages the problem is that in some of those villages they have like water pumps but once they broke they don't know how to fix them so I was able like, to teach them how to maintain it and also fix it so that they don't have to wait for people from the government to come to fix it for them. They can be able like, to do it for themselves. Uh, another project that I did is this project that has a like, real like, long history to me because I tried this project a long time ago, uh, but I kind of like failed, not kind, but I failed on this project. So this project is like a biogas project. So when I made my windmill, a lot of people were asking me, can you use your windmill for, for cooking? Can you power like a cooker? I was like, my windmill doesn't generate enough power to use it like for cooking. But there was like this, there's this problem of deforestation. So I was always like thinking, how can I be able like to help out on that like uh, problem? Because every week women and girls spend between uh, 
eight and nine hours just like looking for fire out. So I was like trying to find the ways of like helping out on solving this like um, energy problem, especially like um, the energy that they can use for cooking. So when I heard that you're going to be able to generate a, a gas, like a biogas, by using a cow manure, if you just put them uh, cow manure in a, like a container and put up some water and wait for heat to generate, I was like, this sounds like simple enough. So one day what I did, it's like I took, when my mom, she went away, I took one of her best like cooking pot, I put up like goat poop in it, and then I put up like some water. I started like boiling it. Um, my mom, she came back home, she found me like in the kitchen, uh, and she asked me, what are you cooking? I'm like, I'm cooking potatoes. But she was like, potatoes doesn't smell like this. <laughs> Trust me, it was smelling so badly. But that project was totally like a failure. So when I learned more about like uh, biogas, I was able like to go back to make this biogas digester, which generate generate gas, although we haven't really like connected to the, uh, to the kitchen, it's still like generating gas that we're going to be able to use for being able like to use for, for cooking. Um, so, so far I'm planning like to be able like to, to extend that project so that they can also be used the manure that have already been processed in the biogas, they can be able to use as a, as like a fertilizer to apply to their field. So that's like one of the projects that um, I'm doing. So now I have, uh, now I've like finished, I've graduated from Dartmouth College and I have one year fellowship uh, in San Francisco. After that fellowship, I'll be like going back to Malawi. I'm still like interested in renewable energies and also I'm interested in trying to, I'm also interested in water and sanitation and also I'm really like interested to start up like a um, innovation center where a student who have like ideas, either it's like high school student or university student who have some idea and they're trying to develop that idea, they can come to the innovation center and trying to find the way that we can be able like to work out with them and connecting them with like professional in that field that they are trying to do. So that's my main like uh, uh, long term goal. So when I look back from the time that I started my work up to this time. I faced like so many challenges that could have simply stopped me from achieving my goals. But for me, I thought that those challenges, they were not there to stop me from achieving what I wanted to achieve, <coughs> but they were there to strengthen me, to make me grow, uh, to make me like uh, think more about anything that I'm doing. So one thing that I can let you uh, I'll let you know like this morning is that in anything that you do at some point, you're going to face some challenges, but don't allow those challenges to take away your dreams. Everything is possible. Even those people that they are successful today, or the entrepreneurs or business people that they are successful, if you ask them at some point, they faced some challenges, but they really didn't give up with the like, ideas. So um, anything is possible. And thank you for having me here, for allowing me like, to share uh, my story with you. Well, William, it's a pleasure having you here at Michigan. Thank you for sharing your story. For those of the, you that weren't a part of the um, common read experience in the College of Engineering, I know a lot of you are in different parts of the university. I just want to recommend to you The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, which is a book authored by William and one of his friends. And this tells basically the story um, of some of these early innovations. Yeah. So I, I want to provide an opportunity to connect a couple dots for the students here and then provide an opportunity for them to ask you questions directly. Remember, the first person we had in this class was Erin Teague of Yahoo. And what, is, what was she talking about? She's talking about the identification of problems. That problems, problems need solutions. And, and we've heard from William um, some of the problems that he was facing and, and how, how he was attempting to solve those by um, using science and technology to bring solutions. And um, we heard recently from uh, the partner at KPMG, Trevor Davies, about Africa and the, the problem of energy, great deficit of energy and the opportunity that presents uh, moving forward. 
And so I want to I want to open up the field uh, for you to ask some questions of William and his experience, um, both in Africa um, and, and now here in the United States as an IDEO fellow in San Francisco. If you have any questions for him. Yeah, I think when I was doing it, I was just taking like uh, pretty much like junk, and the, for me it wasn't like as junk, but I was trying to find the ways of how can I be able like to use, because sometimes when you are like in a, a situation where you don't have like anything, you try like to find like anything that you're going to be able like to fit in on your, on your like, uh, on your plan, on whatever you are trying like to do. Um, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's because I didn't have like any other option, that's why it like uh, made me like to use those like things that people look as like junk. But at the same time, I think one other thing that I can say is like I just also like think that I can be able like to reuse some of the some of the materials that they are kind of like uh, available. Um, I think in terms of like making it like successful, um, I'll try like at least like to get like to reach out like to many many people as possible, like connected like people with like if they are trying to do a project, connecting them with like a uh, professional in that type of like in that in that field. Uh, but in terms of like making it like sustainable, that's one thing that I kind of like started. I've just like started like working and thinking on how well I can make it like uh, sustainable. And one thing that I've been like thinking is that if there's like some like other like company they are doing like some other like work, it can also be able like to help them out like on figuring out on their own like uh, helping out or with their like project and then they can be able like to, uh, to, 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 to fund like to, to pay like the innovation center so that they can keep up like on like uh, on doing the work that we are like we are we are kind of like doing so that's one way of like that's one way that I'm thinking so it's like right now I'm also like I haven't really like uh, finalized like anything tr trying to find how well can I be able like to find like this type of like find find like funds like for this type of project and so far I've been like talking to some people that they are doing kind of like similar similar work like in the, um, in Kenya they have this uh, code I have. It's kind of like also like a kind of like innovation center. They do lots of like a, uh, cell phone software and also like making like some product. So I'm talking to them, trying to see how they started and how they are like a, being like um, maintain like the the process and the, what do I need to know and the stuff like that. So I'm just like being like uh, talking to them, yeah. Um, there's like a lot of things that here, like uh, a lot of people like here, they can be able like to do. So it's like that you have, yeah, when you say like that challenge is not like as challenge as like great need as the way uh, the need we, that I had like uh, for me where it's like, like in Malawi it's only like 7% of the population that they have like access to electricity, which means that there's like big like um, um, opportunity there in that like field. So like for for here, there's like so many other like other things that uh, uh, people they're gonna be able like to use in order like to generate like some opportunities in different like field, which is like it's gonna be like totally like different from the uh, from um, from like they use like in Malawi. Also, like some of the things that you can be able like to do here, like um, as like many many people like in the world they are trying to do like uh, renewable energies. There's, I feel like there's lots of like that type of like a lot of opportunity in like trying to bring like some renewable like energies within like uh, within the the US because that's that's like for most of the system they are not like real like renewable so I think in that area I think um, students like here they can have like some chance some access like to explore what type of like renewable can it like benefit uh, like the country in general yeah. Biggest 
so like the biggest challenge that I had like to face, like when I started, I started with like the windmill project, it's like uh, no one could really like believe me and understand what I was like doing. So they like if I need like to get like some um, some stuff, people didn't really take me as like serious. They thought that maybe something was wrong with me. So it was a little hard like to go like look for like materials to find it. So that was like the biggest challenge that everybody was just like he had like pretty much like a negative view of what I was doing. So like to deal up with that, it was real, it, it was real hard. It was real like a difficult challenge for me. Um, what, uh, why did I decide to go to Dartmouth College? Actually, when, uh, before I applied to Dartmouth College, I was thinking of like going to school somewhere warm, so I don't have to face the winter, the cold. <laughs> but I surprised myself that I end up at Dartmouth. Anyway, so when um, I first heard about Dartmouth through that one of Dartmouth alum who came to our school, he talked about Dartmouth and the when my book came out, I was able like to going around touring around the country, uh, talking about my book. So I was visiting lots of like uh, universities and colleges around like the country. So Dartmouth was one of the schools that I visited. So it's like in a very like very like small small town, and uh, they focus most like uh, they are focus most on undergraduate student, and uh, they are like uh, they have like this like machine shop, which is like open to anybody. You can use it even your freshman year, like your first, first term, you're going to be able to go in there and if you are trying to do, to work on a project, you're going to be able to work on anything. So for me, sometimes I feel like I'm more of like hands-on person. So I thought that if I can go there, I can be able to use that uh, machine shop and also like being able to interact with the uh, professors and also like being able to be like in a small community. I didn't grow up like in a, in a city, so I thought that that would be like a good starting point uh, for me. So some of the challenges that I, I faced there, it's, it's like, because it was like a new, new environment, new culture, so I had like to overcome all those like learning. I'm here like I'm learning like in different like language and sometimes people are speaking like uh, fast than me, so like to be able like to understand those were some of the challenges that I had like to I had like to face. Yeah. Um, if you were to have been able to finish school and you did, how do you think your story would be different? And ultimately, do you think you still would have the time on your hands and the creativity to build the window? Yeah. If I didn't drop out of school, um, that's really like uh, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know if I would have had like courage to to go to to go to the library and the uh, pick up, see the book that like inspired me, or if I would have just like built it. But in terms of like uh, curiosity, my curiosity about like to learn about how different things work, like it started even before before I dropped out of school when I was still like in primary school. So I don't know if that curiosity could have led me to build the windmill at some point or to make something else. So that's uh, one thing that I really like. I really like don't know if I, I would have like a time to do something like that. Yeah. Got a question back there. Yeah, I was wondering if you know how your village has progressed from the surrounding villages since you've left and that foundation didn't get that. How do you live in the How my village have pro progressed since I built the windmill? Um, my village have like progressed a lot. Uh, right now it's like uh, having this like uh, um, solar water pump, people can be able like to get like clean drinking water. Some of them they are using it to to irrigate their like field and also their field to be able like to plant like a vegetable garden. And also like by building that school, uh, rebuilding the school, we installed like solar solar panels. So the student they can be able to go in and study late at night. And also we have like a program where in the afternoon like he women and the men, they go there to learn um, home like economics, just to learn like some skills that they needed for, for their like families. So that's, the, it has been like helping for the, it has been like helping the community to be able like to under, 
understand stuff like uh, stuff like that that they can be able to help their their families. So in that way, I say like it has progressed a lot, and we still have like a long way to go, but slowly we are uh, we are progressing. Yeah. Got a question here. <coughs> Yeah, on that on that note, yeah, there's a lot of things like in terms of agriculture that uh, can be changed, like in Malawi. That I think we need like to to work on it so that so that we can be able like to help out um, many like farmers. One other thing, it's like most uh, like being like a subsistence farmer, it means that you are doing everything by hand, so it takes a lot of time. So I think one thing that I've been thinking is like trying to find the ways of like making the process much easier so that the people can be able to uh, to do it to do like uh, to farm and being able like to uh, to get like enough like uh, crops so because of the the situation like the setting up like of agriculture is still hard many young people they move to town to look for work but while they're in town they don't find like a job so they are just like staying in town and the uh, some people like starting like uh, stealing just because the the process of farming itself is very like discouraging to many uh, to many young people so um, just like for example planting itself we plant by by hand like to plant a field of like <coughs> an acre by yourself it will take like you take you a long time to do it because you are doing anything like by hand so that's one thing that I've been like trying to think it's like if I can make simple machine that can be uh, produced like with like low cost like in the area using like local uh, material resources then it can help out on making like just like for for planting making it much easier and the and the more efficient to many many people yeah. so University of Michigan I'd like to encourage you to read the book the boy who harnessed the wind and I also have a prediction for you this will not be the last time that you hear the name William Kemp Lamba can you join me in thanking him for joining us? Today? Thank you. So our approach at the state of Michigan was to, in fact, begin building that ecosystem that connects all these dots so that companies like those.